Hi, thanks for joining us today for Energy 101, the first in a new series of Google Plus Hangouts covering everything you need to know about specific energy topics. I'm Rebecca Matulka, and I cover energy efficiency and transportation, transportation issues for energy.gov. Today's live discussion will focus on fuel cells, and to answer your questions, we've pulled together a great panel of experts from the department, our national labs, academia, and industry. As a reminder, you can join the conversation and submit your questions on social media using hashtag AskEnergy101. With me today is Dr. Sunita Satyapal. Um, Sunita is the director of the Energy Department's Fuel Cell Technologies Office. Um, we also have Daniel Diedrich, who is the manager of hydrogen and combustion technologies at Sandia National Labs. Our Hello. next panelist is Anthony Eggert, Executive Director of the UC Davis Policy Institute for Energy, Environment, and the Economy. Hello. And last but not least is Charlie Fries, who's the Executive Director of Global Fuel Cell Activities at General Motors. And for everybody out there, just letting you know, um, Charlie, his, his name is really Charlie. Um, he's just using someone's account name, Dan. So just be aware of a technical difficulty. Uh, but to kick off the Hangout, uh, we're going to cover some basic fuel cell questions before we get into yours. So Sunita, why don't you start off first in 30 seconds or less. What is a fuel cell and how does it work? Thanks, Becky. Um, well, a fuel cell is a lot like a battery. It generates electricity. Um, but it doesn't need to be recharged. You have to provide fuel, and you can use different fuels. Um, hydrogen is commonly used. You can use natural gas, uh, biogas, even alcohols. And um, typically, you this is an example of the heart of a fuel cell. And you provide um, fuel on one side, for example, hydrogen, and then air on the other side. And instead of mixing the gases and burning them, which is typically done in mm -hmm. engines, um, you produce electricity directly. You have a membrane which separates the gases and catalysts. And you produce electricity directly, so you don't waste a lot of that energy um, as heat in burning. And you can stack these together to provide the power that you need. Um, they can be small enough to power cell phones or your laptop computer. Um, or large enough to power your home or um, buildings, even cars and buses. And so this is an exciting time for fuel cells. Through the Department of Energy's efforts, we've helped to cut the cost of critical components of fuel cell systems by half in just the last few years. And last year, we tracked about 30,000 fuel cells that were shipped uh, worldwide for several applications. Really great stuff. Um, so our next question is, how could fuel cells change our lives and the way we use energy? And I think, Daniel, this one's a good one for you to answer. Yeah, sure. So fuel cells have a lot of different uh, uh, options uh, for use. And uh, you, you can think about them in, in some regards as being uh, a good way of moving around. And so fuel cells for cars is a great uh, is a great application, so it really could change the way we, we drive. And uh, some, Charlie may be able to say some more about that, but there's also other many other options. For example, personal electronics, we may uh, eventually someday uh, find that we can, you know, uh, have a single charge on our cell phone that lasts many days rather than just one day because of the use of fuel cells in those applications. There's also applications for backup power uh, for, say, telecom and uh, some of those applications were actually demonstrated very well uh, in some of our experience in Hurricane Sandy and uh, providing the sort of stability so people can use their cell phones um, even when the power is out. And so, as you can tell, there's a, a lot of different applications for fuel cells that can be quite uh, transformative. Charlie, did you have anything you wanted to add, or, are, or shall we move on? Sure. Sure, I can, I can add a couple things. I, I think what, for us, what's very exciting about a fuel cell is it, it's something that can make the vehicle perform, in, ter, in the case of transportation, the vehicle will perform very much like anyone's uh, conventional vehicle today. So the vehicle can be refueled very quickly in just a few minutes. It can drive with the over 300-mile range that people expect. 
and it can have very nice performance characteristics, all while being perfectly clean, emitting only water. And, uh, and then it adds the ability so that you can get the fuel from renewable energy sources. So it, it provides a lot of capability in the vehicle that other technologies can't uh, offer all those same technical advantages at the same time. Great, thanks. Um, so our next question is, um, what are the, some of the challenges with fuel cells and what's being done to overcome them? I can help out on that one, Rebecca, if you like. Um, yeah, I think in terms of challenges, uh, I think for fuel cells, the challenge is really cost. And as uh, Zanita mentioned, uh, there's been tremendous progress in reducing the cost by actually orders of magnitude over the last several years. And um, I'm, I'm actually fairly confident that eventually we'll see fuel cells that are cost competitive with conventional technologies and fuel cell vehicles that are cost competitive with uh, conventional vehicles. Um, and that's uh, assuming that uh, we keep investing in, in, uh, in uh, reducing the cost of manufacturing and removing some of the high value materials from the fuel cells. But I think we're on a very good path there. And uh, on the hydrogen side, <clears throat> the challenge is really making sure that for, for the vehicle market, that uh, refueling stations are available for drivers to refuel their vehicles at. And uh, that's being addressed, of course, in the state of California with uh, investments in some of the initial 100 refueling stations, which I'm sure we'll get to chat a little bit more about. Um, and that's really critical for making sure those initial drivers have those stations uh, available. Um, and then also the DOE is focused on the hydrogen fuel activities um, and uh, recently announced uh, a partnership, a national partnership called H2USA, uh, that is focused on uh, coordinating the national rollout of hydrogen infrastructure. So those are those are two challenges, both on the fuel cell side and the hydrogen side, that uh, that uh, are being addressed currently. So if I might, uh, Rebecca, add add a bit to that. Uh, so this is Anthony with uh, University of California at Davis. And uh, we're doing a fair bit of work looking at the infrastructure challenge, uh, which is that you know, as these vehicles come to market, we need to make sure that there's a place for the consumers to fuel them. Um, the work we've done looking at the market in California suggests that we can actually accommodate uh, the early market growth with perhaps as, as few as 100 stations uh, strategically positioned across the state. And there is a program underway right now to, to accomplish that. Um, the other part of that, of course, is to make sure that there's a viable business case uh, for the fuel, and uh, and our analysis suggests that uh, with some fairly modest um, innovation, that these stations can provide fuel uh, per mile basis that's equivalent to what we currently pay for gasoline. Great, thank you. Um, you touched on a lot of questions or questions that we've already got, um, so that was great. Um, and this one's for all of you guys. What is one interesting fact everybody should know about fuel cells? Um, I can start. Um, I think we already met. And a little bit of heat. Um, the only product is water. There are no other uh, pollutants that you typically get in combustion. And and so that's one interesting fact. And when fuel cells were used for uh, space applications, the astronauts actually could drink the water. Great. Anthony? Sure. So I, I think uh, just sort of uh, building on my the previous comments, um, so I think a lot of people might be surprised to know that uh, the manufacturers, uh, including uh, General Motors, but uh, many others, Toyota, Hyundai, uh, Daimler are planning on rolling out fuel cell vehicles to the general public in the commercial market within the next couple of years. Um, and uh, that's a major driver behind the, this infrastructure program that I mentioned in California. Um, and those are be expected to be sold to uh, everyday customers um, and used, as, as Charlie mentioned, uh, in ways that people are familiar with, that they have uh, the ability to re refuel quickly. Uh, have range uh, uh, capacity uh, to drive in the several hundred miles, uh, 300 miles plus. Um, so I think people would be surprised to know that these are, are very similar to what they've come to uh, uh, depend upon in terms of their vehicle performance. 
Great. I think an interesting fact, this is Daniel. An interesting Daniel, fact do you want more? Sure. Yeah, so an inter interesting fact I think would be that there are no moving parts in the fuel cell stack. And so that means there's less things to break uh, in, in your vehicle or in your in your power system. And so I think that's a really exciting thing to think about in terms of uh, reliability and durability. I guess uh, one that I, I would uh, add, Rebecca, everyone that talks about fuel cells has different backgrounds. And, and often, um, if, when you talk to somebody that hasn't been following fuel cells specifically, they're surprised to find out that there are vehicles on the road with fuel cells. But actually, the very first vehicles with fuel cells started all the way back in the 60s with the space program, which Sunita already mentioned. And, and the thing that amazes me is how much the technology has evolved because the very first fuel cell vehicle, um, GM actually drove it in Warren. It was in a full-size van, and it took the entire van to haul the fuel cell and all the equipment to make it work around in the van. So basically it was a three-seated full-size van. You could only have three passengers, in the, with the, including the driver. Now the technology has evolved so far the, the uh, size and, and the packaging has improved to the point where now we can basically fit a fuel cell into just about any vehicle you can imagine. And that's, that's uh, really a, quite an accomplishment if you just think about how much the technology has evolved to allow that to happen. That's pretty amazing, actually. Um, so I just want to let everybody out there watching know that we are having a bit of internet connection, so if we do keep coming in and out, that's why, um, but we're going to keep at answering your questions. Um, our next one is, why do you guys work to advance fuel cells? Charlie, I think you kind of touched on, on that, and but if you want to talk about it a little. Sure, I, I can talk about it a little more. Um, if we look at what what the automakers have been doing for years, our, our goal has been to take the, the vehicle out of the energy and environmental equation. So um, we, we always are working to push emissions to have cleaner vehicles and, and develop technologies that make the vehicle much more efficient and to add options in terms of how we power our vehicles so that we don't rely just on petroleum as the, as the source of energy. And for me, what's so interesting about fuel cells is that it, in one technology, we have something that can contribute to all of those areas and, and help us not just provide the type of personal mobility that people expect, but we can also do it with, with clean emissions, uh, much more efficient than the internal combustion engine, and providing the energy diversity options that we would like to have so we're not reliant on petroleum. And that's, that's a big benefit in the technology. So this is uh, Anthony. Um, and you know, what we're doing at the uh, University of California is really trying to advance the technology, um, figure out ways to, to make it better, and also to really understand all of these uh, technical, economic, uh, business, and policy issues that are likely to influence the adoption of the technology, um, especially as we sort of look towards the, the future of the transportation system, understanding which options have the greatest potential to both uh, meet our societal goals for energy and, and environmental issues, uh, but also provide sort of a viable uh, economic and business case uh, for these technologies um, in, a, in a market economy. Um, you need to be able to have sort of and maintain profitability uh, for these technologies. So really doing the research that allows us to better understand uh, when these technologies become cost competitive, under what conditions, and then what is their overall uh, contribution to the societal goals. I can, Rebecca, if I can add my two cents here. So I think for me, my motivations for uh, working in hydrogen and fuel cells is is really informed by where I live also. Um, you know, living in California, we have some very interesting air basin issues uh, in two areas. And so it's pretty easy to see the benefit of zero emission vehicles and lower emissions systems uh, in those um, in those regions. And so anything I can do to bring you know, our national resources at the national labs to bear to help encourage and accelerate um, those markets and uh, move those vehicles onto the road is extremely exciting for, for me personally because you know, I get to actually observe it uh, real time here in, in the areas that need it most. 
Um, so th that then brings us to our next question. It was a good segue, Daniel. Um, and our question comes from Juan via email. Um, he says that although fuel cells don't produce emissions and the, and the production of hydrogen does, what can fe feasibly be done uh, to reduce the end pollution without breaking the bank? Um, and we've gotten similar questions about um, how to make the production of hydrogen more efficient. So, Sunita, do you want to take that? Sure. Um, and that's a really good point because hydrogen is not a primary energy source. It's really an energy carrier. And even though people say that it's the most abundant element in the universe, you still it's tied up in other forms. Um, and so you do need to produce the hydrogen. Um, it does take energy to produce the hydrogen, but you can produce it from diverse domestic resources, from natural gas, from renewables, um, such as water. You can use solar or wind uh, to split the water. Um, but Juan had a good point that it does take energy to produce the hydrogen. Um, however, because the fuel cell is so much more efficient, when you look at the total energy of the pathway, often we use the term well-to-wheels um, emissions or energy use. Um, the total emissions and the total energy use is significantly reduced. And we are um, conducting a number of, of research activities to help um, reduce that energy consumption to produce the hydrogen. And just a few examples are increasing the efficiency of production. So typically, when you produce hydrogen from natural gas, um, it's about 70% efficient. So you lose about a third of that energy. Um, so we can inc improve efficiency. We're looking at um, biological production of hydrogen, also direct uh, solar to hydrogen production, again, improving efficiencies. So you can reduce the amount of energy that's, that's wasted in that conversion process. But I think the bottom line is because the fuel cell is so much more efficient, that total well-to-wheels um, efficiency um, is, is uh, quite high. And then in terms of cost, um, the cost of producing hydrogen from natural gas, for example, if we produce it at high volume, is already, we've shown, it can be competitive with gasoline. So we're still working on reducing the cost of hydrogen from other approaches. And if I might just add a, a quick uh, comment to that, I think you've explained it quite well, uh, Sunita, but um, you know, using the natural gas example, so a lot of people will your point of the fuel cell being substantially more efficient than, say, combustion is really a key part of that calculation. And so using natural gas to produce hydrogen in a fuel cell is actually more efficient than using natural gas directly uh, within a combustion vehicle. And when you compare uh, natural gas produced hydrogen in a fuel cell to conventional vehicles, you're reducing emissions by about 50% on a total life cycle basis. Um, and as has been mentioned, there's also these other uh, options to move to even cleaner sources like uh, biomass and other renewable sources. Rebecca, if I could add something here. Um, an another thing to think about is, as Sunita mentioned, hydrogen is really an energy carrier. It's a, it's a way to store energy in an efficient way that we can package it on board a vehicle or, or in other ways, uh, storing it stationary for long periods of time, that sort of thing. And one of the things that it can allow us to do, to do is cross over between things like transportation and energy production. And when you talk about renewables like wind, which are highly irregular and difficult to predict, um, rather than, than paying wind farm operators to shut down turbines when the demand doesn't match the supply, we have the opportunity with hydrogen to actually capture that energy and then store it and use it as a, a transportation fuel, which is something that uh, is, is a very good way to use hydrogen once it's produced. So that there are a lot of advantages to hydrogen that all open up that other energy storage mechanisms may not be as ideally suited for long periods of time and, and some of the flexibility to move between sectors. Great. So our next question actually comes from you, man on Twitter. Um, and you, man would like to know, how can young people become engaged in hydrogen and fuel cells? Um, well, there are definitely a lot of opportunities. Um, we have activities funded through the Department of Energy. We have, for example, a hydrogen, hydrogen uh, student design contest 
that we've uh, supported for quite some time. Um, we have a lot of activities that we're funding at universities, their so research development activities, and um, in our market transformation and education and outreach um, efforts, we've um, conducted training, um, developed course material, mm -hmm. and so there's um, quite a few examples where um, students and young people can get involved with uh, working on fuel cells and education and outreach efforts. Great. Yeah, so, so other things, uh, Rebecca, that we've done I, through the Society of Automotive Engineers, um, there have been uh, programs where GMs help sponsor packages of, of uh, different development and teaching tools where we use, it's called a world in motion, and we use fuel cells and other technologies like that to take it to school so kids can become exposed to some of what the technology has to offer and, and how you can, you can uh, improve the efficiency of vehicles going forward with things like that. And then with the, the fleet of vehicles that we continue to operate, uh, one of the fun parts of the job is to be able to take those vehicles to schools and show kids real working vehicles that have fuel cells because it just you can just see the, the light bulbs go off in their minds when they see what's possible uh, by seeing something real that they can sit in and touch. That, that I mean, we all need more education on clean energy technology, so it's great that you guys are doing it with fuel cells. Um, Charlie, actually, this next question is directly for you. Um, a lot of buzz going on with the Detroit Auto Show um, with fuel cell vehicles. And Peter from the hydrogen and fuel cell letter um, would like to know what's on the horizon for GM and fuel cells. Well, GM has been developing fuel cells for, for many years. I actually going, as I mentioned before, all the way back to the 60s. Uh, the, the development program that we're really in the heart of right now has been for the last 10 to 15 years focused on making the technology really something we could commercialize. And we've worked through one by one the key things that are challenges, whether it be the durability or ability to cold start uh, in very cold climates and, and ability to package the hydrogen on board and get the range. So we've ticked those off one by one. And the things that we continue to focus on now are in the areas of, of getting the cost down because we know that the infrastructure is going to grow in, in regions and it's not going to be something where you snap your fingers and coast to coast there's a hydrogen infrastructure. It'll be focused in some key areas and then it'll grow from there. So the, as an automaker, the biggest thing we can do is to take the cost of the fuel cell out so that within whatever infrastructure is available, more people can afford to buy the vehicle within that marketplace and then that can help support the infrastructure with more demand on the hydrogen. So we focus mostly on the hydrogen uh, uh, infrastructure and the cost of the vehicle and trying to push those two things forward, which is why we partnered with Honda so that the, the two OEMs together can develop this next generation technology, make some big drastic movements in terms of taking cost out, and then try to make the technology more affordable for more people. So that's what we're doing right now, and, and it also gives us the ability to get scale so we can bring the costs down over time through making many of them. Great. So our next question, um, is from David, and he would like to know what size of fuel cell has been efficiently and reliably developed thus far? Um, there are actually a number of sizes that have been mm -hmm. developed and demonstrated, even commercially. Um, it can range from really small to power your, uh, recharge your cell phone or your laptop. These are actually commercially available. Um, you can buy them online, in fact. Um, and then in terms of sizes, um, fuel cells that can power your homes, uh, there have been several thousand actually demonstrated, especially in Japan, um, that are providing electricity and hot water to homes. And then even as large, of course, with, with cars and, and buses, they've also been demonstrated. And even as large as uh, 60 megawatts, which is the world's largest, uh, demonstrated in Korea by essentially stringing together a number of, of fuel cells. So in answer to the question, it's just a, a range of sizes that have been reliably uh, demonstrated. Great. So there's a lot of interest out there actually um, in, in automotive fuel cells. Um, and ECS on Twitter wants to know how long an automotive fuel cell will last and will it be able to be replaced? 
So I could take that one. The, the technology that we're developing, we're targeting it to be transparent with other vehicle technologies. So when we design a fuel cell, we're designing it to last for, for a typical vehicle life. You're, you're looking at something 150,000 miles or more and, and 10 to 15 years of life. And that's, that's typical to what other vehicle technologies are that are on the road today. And our fuel cells right now, we have a, a very large fleet that's still running, and we're actually about to cross 3 million miles uh, with that vehicle fleet. Individual cars are already uh, exceeding 100,000 miles on individual cars. So that's what we're doing in real-world driving on, on the road today. And then we have laboratory tests going where we continue to push and stress the technology even ahead of building the next round of vehicles. So, great. Thank you so much, Charlie. Um, there's a lot of talk um, on Twitter and even through email. Um, people really want to know about fuel cells and utilities. Um, Jessica on Twitter um, asks, are fuel cells still too expensive to be adopted um, by cost-conscious utilities? Uh, and we've got similar questions from Intelligent Utility um, in addition to our email questions. Would like to answer. That. <laughs> um, I can take a stab at it, and then others can chime in. But basically, it is true that there are a lot of advantages to fuel cells. They're easily dispatchable, can follow the loads. Um, I think utilities have been very interested. Um, however, the cost is still high. Um, that is a challenge. Costs are coming down, and uh, we've seen, uh, for instance, um, examples. If you look at the cost of electricity. Uh, that's provided with a fuel cell. Again, there are many assumptions here. It depends on both the capital cost, the installation, and so forth. Um, but especially since natural gas prices are so low, um, there's increased interest in using fuel cells. Um, the cost of electricity can range from, you know, let's say roughly about 15 cents a kilowatt hour. So we're still looking at reducing the cost um, so we can reduce the cost of electricity. But there are a number of incentives out there um, to, uh, for, for purchasing fuel cells. I think that's helping uh, to bring the cost down. And one of the key, um, I think, uh, important areas that we need to focus on is to increase the demand. So right now there isn't as much interest in fuel cells, which means the volume of uh, producing fuel cells is low, which keeps the cost high. So if we can bundle demand like what's being done in Japan and Korea, that will help reduce the costs and um, you know, increase interest by the utilities. If I might just uh, add a bit there, and I think this is this is a, important to remind folks that the, there is a diversity of different types of fuel cells. The, the version that Sunita held up at the beginning was what's called a, a proton exchange uh, membrane fuel cell, um, for the which is sort of the primary technology that's used within the automotive market. In stationary power, there's a diversity of different types of fuel cells, uh, solid oxide fuel cells that, that run at higher temperatures, phosphoric acid, molten carbonate fuel cells, um, and there's sort of a, more of a competition of technology for distributed generation. Uh, the one advantage that they do have, uh, especially some of those higher temperatures, that they can use a number of different uh, inputs, um, uh, natural gas, biogas, uh, and other things, and they can be cited in areas that do have um, uh, issues with uh, environmental issues because of their very, very low uh, emissions, uh, close to zero. Uh, so I think we're going to see uh, within the market sort of an experimentation over the next couple of years, um, especially in, in areas where there are uh, opportunities to develop uh, distributed generation uh, with very, very low emissions, and, and uh, certainly in California we're doing some of that as well. Um, and actually, one, one last point on that. There is an interesting application in California uh, which is, uses something called tri-generation, uh, which basically takes uh, landfill gas, which is the, the methane emissions that come off of a landfill, uh, puts it into a high-temperature fuel cell, and produces electricity, heat, uh, which is also used, and hydrogen for, uh, for vehicle refueling. Um, and that's an exciting application of a certain type of fuel cell. Well, Anthony, that was a great segue to our next question. Um, Patricia would like an update on the Energy Department's TriGen um, fuel, station, fuel cell station and whether it's a model we should replicate. Great. Thank you. And um, as Anthony mentioned, um, we demonstrated that this was actually the world's first TriGen 
um, system. Most people are familiar with cogeneration or combined heat and power. And in tri-generation, you produce electricity and heat, but you also produce hydrogen. So that's what's called tri-generation. And as Anthony mentioned, we, we demonstrated that. We funded that along with our uh, partners in California and industry. Um, and it was using uh, sewage waste, essentially, to uh, produce electricity, heat, and hydrogen. Uh, can produce about 100 kilograms a day, and uh, that's enough to fuel more than 30 vehicles a day. So far, um, to answer the question, uh, we've produced more than 12,000 kilograms of hydrogen, and that's enough to, um, we have enough to power to power a couple hundred homes. But if you look at the typical wastewater treatment plants, um, there you can produce, basically have enough power to produce power a few thousand homes. Um, so we do think that this has been a successful demonstration, and there is a lot of interest in using it as a model, uh, replicating it in other plants. Great. I, this is Daniel, if I could add. I think this is a really exciting area because there are a lot of cities that um, have their own wastewater treatment facilities, and currently what they do is they end up uh, flaring or burning off the renewable natural gas that comes from that process. And uh, this gives folks a really great opportunity to realize the value of that uh, renewable natural gas that's being produced and turn it into three very uh, valuable things, power, heat, and fuels. And so I think this is an extremely exciting area uh, in the area of fuel cells and hydrogen. Great. So our next question actually um, c talks about infrastructure. And Robert would like to know, um, he says, it appears that the primary hurdle to establishing a fuel cell-based transportation is developing a refueling infrastructure that offers a relative degree of consumer convenience. Um, and then he talks about California's plans to offer more hydrogen fueling stations. Um, so he'd like a little insight um, into this, and then we have other people who are who are also asking about developing a national hydrogen highway. So I can I can kick that off. Um, uh, as I mentioned earlier, California is uh, right currently now under developing a uh, infrastructure. There was a bill that was passed by the legislature last year um, that provides uh, resources to the California Energy Commission. Uh, to uh, up to $20 million a year to partner with um, uh, the private sector uh, fuel infrastructure developers uh, to put out up to 100 stations. And our research suggests that that is uh, sufficient for this early market. Um, in order to do that, you need to really have a good understanding of where these markets exist and coordinate that deployment of infra infrastructure with uh, the vehicle uh, vehicles uh, over the next three to five years. Um, after that point, uh, regular market forces are likely to sort of pick up uh, where that leaves off in terms of the further development of infrastructure within the state. Um, and as uh, Charlie had also mentioned, you know, ultimately we do need to move beyond uh, single states and think about this as a national market. Uh, but I think that that is something that can flow from these early efforts. Thank you. So our next question um, it was briefly covered already, but I think it would be good for those who are just joining us. Um, John on Google Plus, he'd like to hear more about fuel cells being used up as back or used in backup power. Um, and he also says that Microsoft, Apple, eBay, and Google are all employing fuel cells for their data centers. Okay, I can touch on that and then maybe turn it over to some of the California folks online. Um, we have actually funded, um, cost shared some of the fuel cells for backup power for cell phone towers, part of our the Recovery Act. And um, as Daniel mentioned, especially with Hurricane Sandy, when we lost power and uh, cell phone towers lost power, the fuel cells operated perfectly. Um, we had other examples as well. In fact, the new World Trade Center um, Freedom Tower is going to have almost five megawatts of fuel cells um, that can provide power when the, the grid goes down using natural gas. Um, so we have uh, major companies now, for example, Sprint, that we've also been uh, funding uh, through cost share projects. 
uh, demonstrating um, several hundreds of um, cell phone towers now that are operating with uh, fuel cells for backup power. All right. Uh, Daniel, Anthony, either of you want to jump in? Maybe I'll just add then that there, are, um, since you mentioned uh, specific examples of companies, um, some of the larger fuel cells, the ones that I mentioned for cell phone towers are typically small in the kilowatt range. But in terms of data centers, where obviously you want to have reliable power, um, you know, as we're talking right now, for instance, we don't want the power to go out. <laughs> we have internet problems. Um, and we've seen companies like Verizon, uh, for instance, um, they've installed um, megawatts, seven megawatts of uh, fuel cells. And another interesting point is that not only can the fuel cell provide reliable power, electricity, to run the data center, but in, in that case, they pro provided cooling as well since a lot of heat is generated on the data centers. So you can use the waste heat from the fuel cell to also run a chiller. So that's another um, example of a benefit of fuel cells. Great. So, Sunita, this next question uh, is for you as well. Cap Energy Policy on Twitter wants to know, what is the federal government doing to advance the development of fuel cells? Um, that's a great question. We've actually been doing quite a lot. Um, in our office alone, we've, uh, we're funding about $100 million per year for research, development, and demonstration of fuel cells. Um, it goes all the way down to specific components. When I showed the heart of the fuel cell, we have catalysts involved, membranes, very costly components. And so we've been uh, funding universities, national labs, uh, many companies to help reduce the amount of platen Platinum, for example, which is an expensive component of a fuel cell. Um, we actually, through our efforts, um, have been funding hydrogen production, hydrogen storage, delivery, and um, we have, uh, through the efforts, enabled about 450 patents, um, U.S. patents, and about 40 technologies that are now commercial in the market. These could be catalyst membranes, even complete fuel cell systems. And then also through the federal funding, it's helped to enable about 65 additional uh, technologies that we think will be commercial uh, within the next three to five years. And then in addition to the uh, research and development, we've, we're also helping to co-fund uh, demonstration activities and deployments. So helping to cost share, actually validating these technologies under real world conditions. Um, as Charlie mentioned, we also have about more than 3 million miles of driving on some of these vehicles, getting data. Um, the cell phone towers, we all have also co-funded early market applications like forklifts. Um, and so now we're seeing major companies like FedEx, Wegmans, Coca-Cola, Whole Foods that are actually using uh, fuel cells, uh, for instance, for forklifts. So those are just a few examples of the type of activities that, um, that we're doing at, at DO DOE. Great. So I know that um, Anthony has to catch a plane, so we should wrap this up. So our last question is for all of you, um, and we can start with Anthony. What does the future of fuel cells look like? Anthony, we're having trouble hearing you. So since we're having trouble hearing Anthony, we'll, we'll go to Daniel first uh, and then work our way down. Sure. Sounds good. Uh, so the future of uh, fuel cells is, like Sunita said initially, this is an extremely exciting time to be involved in fuel cells, especially for those of us that have been doing it for a little, you know, for a few years. Um, but uh, over the next couple of years, we're going to be seeing vehicles on the road, uh, especially here in California. And there's going to be a lot of experience uh, that the consumers are going to be having with vehicles and with fuel cell technologies. And so it's going to be a real growth period for fuel cells and uh, a very exciting time. Uh, it's very rare that you get to see a new technology get rolled out on this sort of scale and, and uh, in this sort of retail environment. So very excited about the next few years in terms of what it looks like. I think in the long term, um, especially when we think about uh, power solutions for um, for the grid connection and, and making sure that we can have lots of renewables put onto the grid. Fuel cells have a really important role there, so we're going to see more and more fuel cells on the grid to help uh, stabilize 
uh, our, our utility uh, situation in our grid in the nation. Great, Charlie, you want to go next? Sure. Uh, I think that the thing that's really exciting that a fuel cell technology advancement could really help with is as we watch the technology, it's, it, it brings the, the things that people expect from vehicles today and, and from the ability to have backup power and all the other areas of the economy that rely on power generation, whether it's to move things or to power stationary homes, those types of things. What it does is it opens up the ability to have many different energy sources and to, to do that in a clean way so we don't need to worry about the emissions that come out the other side. And uh, when, I, when I focus back on just the car itself and what the fuel cell does for vehicles, uh, it, it provides a clean transportation technology that's efficient and it also can look, you can look further and find advantages that aren't present today. For instance, every fuel cell that's out, out there has a, has a powertrain on it that produces about 132 kilowatts of power. And that's what's needed if you want to accelerate cars and travel at uh, autobahn speeds and things like that in Europe. But most of the time, you don't need all that power. And what a, what a fuel cell can do is it can actually become a backup generator for emergency situations. So we're developing fuel cells right now that you can, you can park next to a building and turn them into a 25 kilowatt generator. And that's a brand new, um, a, new, a new capability that doesn't exist when you just look at your car that's in the garage today. So I think you'll see a lot of new ways that you can use the technology and exploit the advantages of it that are just now starting to be understood. And so I don't look at just as how do you replace one technology with another, but how do you take that technology and do things you could never do before? Great. Should we try Anthony one last time? No. So Anthony, we can't hear you. I'm so sorry. <laughs> The, the perils of social media and technology. Um, so next, I guess, Sunita, do you want to wrap that one up? And um, sure, I guess. Um, I agree with everything that's been, been said. I think this is an exciting time. Um, I think a lot of people actually don't know much about fuel cells. In fact, um, I, mentioned, I mentioned this before, but when I talk about fuel cells, some people think I'm talking about stem cells. Um, and so the future, I see uh, more people aware about fuel cells. They're so versatile, as was mentioned, portable power, stationary power, transportation. And we have a huge opportunity using natural gas now. And then obviously using hydrogen, where you have no emissions. Um, they're clean. We've also done studies showing that the market is huge, 100 uh, billion. Um, in terms of the market. We're seeing um, increased um, commercialization of fuel cells, especially Japan, Korea, Germany. And so I see the future as uh, costs coming down significantly and um, fuel cells being used for many applications. Great. Well, that's it for today's Google Plus Hangout on Energy 101 fuel cells. This Hangout will be archived on our YouTube channel and energy.gov. Um, thanks for everyone who joined us in submitting questions. Thanks to all of our panelists for taking time out of your day to answer everybody's fuel cell questions. Um, for more on fuel cells, be sure to check back on energy.gov.